a flood of black pitch. On Wednesday, 8 September, Vienna celebrated the Nativity of the Blessed Virgin Mary. The Emperor Leopold's grandfather, Ferdinand II, had declared that Mary, the Mother of God, was the Generalissima Sacrale who commanded the Habsburg armies in their struggles against heretic Protestants and infidel Turks alike. In the cathedral and throughout the city, the day was celebrated with special fervor, and priests, served by altar boys and thurifers, brought the host to the men on the walls. At the masses held through the day, soldiers and civilians alike prayed for their supreme commander and patroness to save them in this their hour of desperate need. There was a hint that a miracle might indeed unfold before their eyes. The nightly procession to St. Stephen's to launch the signal rockets from the roof had become a vain ritual, but on the night of 8 September, there was the long-hoped-for response. As the rockets soared into the sky, flared, and died away, the little party prepared to descend the narrow stairway into the cathedral. Then they noticed, high on the Collenberg Hill to the west of the city, five rockets as a signal that our expected succors were at hand, answered by us in the same manner. But on the following day, from the walls, they saw only the Grand Vizier massing his men far back out of cannon shot. It was clear that there was intense activity all along the battlefront. Signs of renewed Turkish mining, men moving into the trenches. During that day, there was less gunfire, often an ominous prelude to the explosion of a mine. At two in the afternoon, a mine brought down more of the wall of the Lobel Bastion, and Starenberg's men now knew where the assault was likely to come. Men stood side by side in reserve behind both bastions, while others dug trenches and built redoubts in the space between the new defenses and the old city wall. Many of the guns on the bastions and the wall were now firing canister shot instead of cannonballs, canvas sacks filled with scraps of iron, old nails, and slivers of flint and sharp stones, while only a few pieces waged an artillery duel with the Ottoman guns dug into the trench lines farther away. Two Turkish assaults were made on the new breaches on the bastion, but were driven back with heavy losses. All the while, Count Starenberg applied his utmost care towards making retrenchments and traverses, repairing the ramparts, reproving the breaches upon the bastions, fortifying the streets and houses near the ramparts and bastions with iron chains and barricados, that in every place and on every event the enemy might find all resistance imaginable. This stalwart resistance was likely to prove fruitless. Savage hand-to-hand -hand fighting was at the heart of the Ottoman art of war. It had by 1683 become common to talk about the Turks' decline, about how the Janissaries had gone soft, how they had lost the military virtue of their predecessors. This was not how the soldiers who faced them in the breaches at Vienna or in battles afterwards saw it. They faced an enemy in a state of spiritual exaltation, brimming with confidence, courage, and daring. One Janissary wrote, We are the believers since the beginning of the world. Since that time we have recognized the unity of Allah. We will sacrifice our heads for this belief. We have been the intoxicated ones from all eternity. We are the butterflies of the divine light. We are in this world a legion forever in ecstasy before the grandeur of Allah. And the defenders saw before them the truth of the final lines of this manifesto. We are so numerous that we cannot be counted upon the fingers. Our spring is inexhaustible. Habsburg soldiers knew their enemy's spirit. The English ambassador Sir Robert Sutton later wrote of a battle on the River Pruth in 1711. A Janissary coming before the vizier's tent crying out, Shall we lie here to die of sickness and misery? Let all true Muslimen follow me to attack the infidels. He snatched up one of the colors, Tuj, that stood before the tents and went forwards. He was immediately followed by other Janissaries, the hand-picked assault troops, said Engechti, and the desperados, Delhi, gathered together and with their usual cries moved towards the enemy. They were repulsed three times with a loss of about 8,000 men. These were the heaven-selected warriors, and once inside the walls they would be impossible to dislodge. 
a century after the siege of Vienna, a Habsburg general writing of the Turks defending a city declared, it is beyond the human powers of comprehension to grasp just how obstinately the Turks defend themselves. As soon as one fortification is demolished, they simply dig themselves another one. It is easier to deal with any conventional fortress and with any other army than with the Turks when they are defending a stronghold. On 8 September, it looked certain that the Ottomans would take the city. It was also likely that, once in possession, with all the defenders slaughtered and the city depopulated, they would not be easily dislodged. Although the defenders hoped that relief was at hand, the Turks displayed no signs of alarm or panic. They continued working on their minds as if they feared nothing from abroad. Day by day, the strength of the Turks' assault grew, despite the increasingly obvious presence of a large Christian force in the hills above the city. From early in July, the only sizable Habsburg force beyond the walls of Vienna had been Lorraine's battle-scarred cavalry dragoons and cuirassiers, plus a few precious musketeers on foot. They had blocked every advance by the Turks and Hungarians along the northern bank of the Danube, throwing back every Ottoman column probing westward. Now, two months later, they prepared to join with an army of relief that had gathered to the west of Vienna, fully equipped and ready for action. These were not Leopold's own men, but contingents drawn from the states and cities of the Holy Roman Empire, and a cavalry army led by his ally, the King of Poland. The empire had many critics and few defenders. The preeminent political philosopher Samuel Puffendorf wrote in 1667 of a body that conforms to no rule and resembles a monster. Europe's primordial savant Voltaire later apostrophized it as follows. This body, which was called and which still calls itself the Holy Roman Empire, was neither holy nor Roman nor an empire. As a body, it was indeed enfeebled, but its individual limbs were extremely powerful. The new armies of Brandenburg, Bavaria, and Saxony, the quintessence of three decades of war up to 1648, were second to none. Some of the smaller states had smaller forces, but of high quality. The empire, after the end of the Thirty Years' War, had been regarded as a fossil, seemingly incapable of any coherent action whatsoever. Yet this moribund empire had produced both infantry and cavalry, about 40,000 men from both Catholic and Protestant states, for the salvation of Vienna. What brought the German soldiers was a mixture of political, economic, and psychological motives. But the most powerful was fear. They also benefited considerably from subsidies and other payments made from the funds flowing from the Vatican into Leopold's treasury. The German states that contributed most to the relief force were those that would be next in line if the Ottoman army, triumphant at Vienna, moved further west. Bavaria would be among the first victims. So too would the duchies and principalities of Swabia and Franconia. If the Turks pushed northwards, the electorate of Saxony would be in their line of march. Their support for the Habsburgs in 1683 was directly related to the sense of threat from the east. With the exception of Hanover, which sent the heir to the duchy, George, later to succeed as King George I of England, with a token contribution of 600 cavalry, the powerful states of northern Germany, like Brandenburg, eventually chose not to send troops to join the alliance. The direct Ottoman threat to them was negligible. The Emperor Leopold could call for support from the entire empire, but he and his diplomats had sensibly concentrated their efforts on those with the strongest interest in saving Vienna. First to move was his future son-in-law, Max Emanuel, the Elector of Bavaria. On 6 August, he committed himself to sending more than 11,000 men, including five infantry regiments. In fact, his troops were already on the move. They passed Passau under the approving eye of the Emperor at the end of July, and marched east along the Danube to set up camp beside the Trison River on the northern bank, less than 50 miles from Vienna. The states of Franconia and Swabia, after some hard bargaining with the emperor, provided 6,000 infantry and 2,000 cavalry. They were at Passau on 21 August and encamped at Linz on 30 August. 
The final and perhaps most valuable contingent was the Saxon troops led by the Elector of Saxony, John George, in person. His force of 7,000 musketeers, 2,000 horsemen, and some of the best light field artillery in Europe moved slowly southeast through Bohemia to the town of Maisau. By the end of August, there were more than 20,000 infantry in bivouacs on the plain north of the Danube. It was not an overwhelming force, but with the addition of its major component, numerically speaking, the Polish cavalry, then still moving south, it could certainly challenge the Ottomans. Most important, it was fresh, eager to do battle, and well-financed. The miracle that might save Vienna was not just the men gathering north of the river bridges across the Danube, but the torrent of money pouring from the Vatican into the Emperor's treasury, and hypothecated exclusively for the war against the Turk. The contingents from the Empire, with the exception of Bavaria, required to be paid handsomely for their services, and all their expenses had to be met. By August 1683, Leopold was near bankrupt. He had exhausted almost all his financial resources, nor could he borrow money. The extravagantly rich Archbishop of Salzburg rejected a pleading personal letter from the Emperor out of hand. But Benedetto Odescalchi, elected as Pope in 1676 and taking the resonant name of Innocent XI, was obsessed with the Ottoman threat. He was also preoccupied with the menace of Louis XIV's France, which occupied the papal territory of Avignon, undermined the Pope's authority within the Catholic Church, and pursued a foreign policy diametrically opposed to Innocent's plans and wishes. Thus, supporting Leopold, a faithful and pious son of the Church, and afflicted by the French in the West and the Ottomans in the East, would advance Innocent's political as well as his ethical ends. The Pope believed, like his predecessor Pius V a century before, that he had an extraordinary opportunity to halt the advance of Islam, if only the united forces of Christendom could be marshaled. The answer was a coalition led by the Pope, a holy league, like that which under Pius V's patronage had produced the stunning victory at Lepanto in 1571. Even if the Pope had no military sanction, he could deploy both economic and ideological power. Only he could unlock the vast resources at the disposal of the Church. Only he could authorize taxes on ecclesiastical lands, collections to be levied on the surpluses generated within the richer diocese, or offer valuable spiritual benefits to the laity in exchange for voluntary contributions to the great cause. Few secular states could raise money with such ease, certainly not Leopold. Innocent had worked hard from the beginning of his pontificate to curb waste and extravagance and to improve the financial structures of the Holy See. As a result, the Vatican had money to spend on his great project. The Pope bankrolled the Army of Liberation for Vienna, as he had King John III Sobieski in Poland. On 31 August, the long-awaited Polish host appeared after a long journey to the Danube. Charles of Lorraine rode to greet the King of Poland, riding at the head of about 3,000 light horsemen. The bulk of the Poles followed behind, led by 2,000 of the Husaria, the fabled noble winged horsemen, and 10,000 other cavalry, plus a few foot soldiers. The Polish Hussars were a unique elite shock force, heavily armored in plate armor and chain mail, resplendent in leopard skins and plumed helmets. They rode with a lance, copia, of about 16 foot in length, two swords, and a brace or more of pistols. The role of the Husaria, striking en masse at full gallop with lowered lances, was to crack open any enemy formation, while the lighter horsemen armed with sabers, maces, and hand axes chased behind, slaughtering the disordered foe. The Polish Hussars were heavy cavalry par excellence, and they had no equivalent in 17th century Europe. In effect, a holdover from the great age of medieval chivalry, man and horse together were a missile, with their lance, or wielding their long spear-like triangular swords, concerts, more than four foot long, they existed only for the charge. 
facing the disciplined volley fire of Western armies, they had largely become a liability. But against the Janissary infantry of the Ottomans, or the loose-flowing formations of the Sipahis, they could be as devastating as artillery fire. As the new army of Christendom assembled, Lorraine met all the commanders and gained the confidence of each in turn. He won over the suspicious and thin-skinned Polish king with a respectful but also comradely tone. He, a Duke of Lorraine, implicitly acknowledged the king's superior status, but also appealed to him soldier to soldier as a comrade in arms. The Polish king, actually 14 years older than the duke, often appeared the more vigorous man, and certainly much grander in poise and appearance. Two months in the field made Lorraine look even more dowdy than his customary lack of style. The danger was a chaotic assembly of ill-coordinated soldiers, each section led towards glory by a self-obsessed commander. Lorraine managed his fellow commanders with the greatest skill. The problem was not new to him. The Habsburg Corps of Officers had for more than 70 years been a hodgepodge of Italians, Germans, Scots, Irish, English, and French. Charles of Lorraine, himself a distant descendant of the ancient kings of Lotharingia, a prince of the empire and a son-in-law of the emperor, had long before learned the art of winning the confidence of those with whom he served. He also had the knack of winning over almost everyone he met, from bluff, self-opinionated fighting soldiers to conniving courtiers. He had no great ambitions, but he wanted to succeed against the Turks. Above all, he was determined to save Vienna. Yet time was short. Charles of Lorraine's fellow commanders had only the haziest notion of the true situation and the power of the Ottoman advance. He alone had recently come to grips with the Turks, smashing a powerful Ottoman advance along the northern bank of the river late in July. Only he had watched the city under assault week by week and knew how close Starenburg was to being overwhelmed. Yet Charles of Lorraine did not command the largest part of the relief army, and he ranked well below the King of Poland and John George, the Elector of Saxony. Lorraine recognized that this was a temporary alliance, with each leader having his own ambitions as well as subscribing to the great overall objective. So he could not command them, but he had to persuade them that his plan was the best of the limited number of alternatives. Lorraine had a disarming charm and an easy manner, and appeared to all as a simple battlefield soldier. He challenged nobody. John Sobieski commented negatively only on his poor clothes, and spoke warmly of his courage and soldierly bearing. Gathered at the castle of Stetteldorf, owned by Count Hardegg, almost in sight of the Danube, close to the town of Stockerau, all the main players planned the decisive battle that would settle the fate of Vienna. The Duke represented the Habsburg forces and the Emperor. General Hannibal von Degenfeld took the place of his master, Max Emanuel, the Elector of Bavaria. Degenfeld was a fine organizer, but also an adventurer who made his career successively in the armies of Saxony, Bavaria, and the Republic of Venice. He was following a family tradition. His father had fought in the Thirty Years' War with the Imperials under Tilly and Wallenstein, then with the Swedes, finally with the French, and ended his days in the comfortable service of Venice. The third professional soldier was the Field Marshal of the Holy Roman Empire, Count Karl von Waldeck. Battle-scarred like Lorraine, he had fought for Brandenburg, for the Swedes in Poland, with Montecuccoli and Lorraine at St. Gothard, and would finally end his career as General Field Marshal to William III in the Netherlands. Between them, they quickly agreed a plan of attack, along the lines that Lorraine proposed. The Emperor, whom Waldeck had openly suggested showed cowardice in abandoning his capital, had wanted a more cautious advance, following the easier ground and approaching Vienna from the south. Lorraine, knowing that every day counted, proposed that they should take the shortest route, due east across the long mountainous outcrop of the Wienerwald, the Vienna Woods. They ignored Leopold's implicit command, and concentrated on the more daring and risky direct route. All the contingents north of the river would rendezvous towards the Danube crossing points on 5 September. The Saxons would cross to the southern bank across the old bridge of Stein near Krems, and with the Bavarians advance to make camp before the town of Tuln. 
On the northern bank of the river opposite Thun, the land was a riparian bog known colloquially as the Danube Meadows. Over ten days, Lorraine's men had hacked out a rough road through these marshlands and built two pontoon bridges across to Thun. On the southern side, Lorraine's engineers, under his Scots aide Leslie, protected the southern bank with a wooden palisade against the Tartars who still made attacks in the plain. The first of the sustained autumn rains raised the height and flow of the river, and the pressure of water broke the frail bridge apart several times. On 6 September, the rain stopped, and the following day the Polish horsemen began to cross, followed by Lorraine's men, all except three battalions of cavalry and a few foot soldiers left behind to protect the river Travers. Crossing a river was one of the most risky maneuvers in 17th century warfare, and there were real fears that the Tartars would try to disrupt it. On the north bank there were still large numbers of Ottoman regulars and their Hungarian allies, their exact location unknown, even after Lorraine's crushing victory over them ten days before. The Poles had to leave all their supply wagons behind, because the temporary bridge was not solid enough to take so much weight. After it was strengthened and the flow diminished a little, they were able to take them across one at a time. By 9 September, only half the baggage train was across the river, by which time the army had already set out for Vienna. The supplies had to be sent downriver from Linz by barge. The combined army that gathered on the plain before Tuln was issued with enough bread to last them a week, and they were expected to be in the hills above Vienna within three or four days. But soon thereafter they would run out of food and supplies, and there was none to be gleaned from the ravaged countryside as they approached Vienna. This was to be no promenade. On 8 September, the birthday of the Blessed Virgin Mary, all the troops drew up for a review on the flat ground before the palisade at Tuln. There were three ruling princes, John III Sobieski, King of Poland, John George, the Elector of Saxony, and the young Max Emanuel, Elector of Bavaria, who had now joined his men the professional commanders, and a large group of young nobles who had flocked to join the crusade to save Vienna. One of them, attached to the bodyguard of Charles of Lorraine, was the slightly built young prince of the House of Savoy, Eugene, in his first experience of war. As Prince Eugene, he was to become, in the opinion of Napoleon Bonaparte, one of the greatest commanders of all time. Earlier, Lorraine had dispatched 600 dragoons under a Colonel Heisler to ride hard towards Vienna, scout the Turkish positions, and if possible take up a defensible position on the Kallenberg, or Bleak Mountain. It was Heisler who would fire the signal rockets that told Vienna's defenders that relief was on its way. From Thuln to Vienna was little more than 20 miles, but there was only a single high road winding up through the Wienerwald. To either side of the forest there were myriad pathways through the hills and deep valleys, and a better road that followed the Danube. The final plan was agreed. The Duke of Lorraine would be in overall command of the left wing, closest to the Danube, with all imperial infantry and cavalry and the Saxon contingent. The Elector of Saxony would have direct authority over his own troops. The center was made up of the Franconian and Bavarian infantry under the command of Count Waldeck, and then to their right the Bavarian and Franconian cavalry with Max Emanuel riding with his own men, but the overall command of the wing given to Julius Francis, Duke of saxon lauenburg one of the few North German rulers to come to the aid of Vienna. The traditional place of honor on the right wing was held by the Poles under their king, John Sobieski. In simple terms, the infantry was concentrated on the left and the bulk of the cavalry on the right, with the army intending to descend the hills in a huge arc, stretching from the Danube to beyond the Wien River, attacking the whole western face of the vast Ottoman camp encircling the city. At dawn on 9 September, the Habsburg and German forces struck their tents on the plain of Thuln and began their march east. The thousands of Polish horsemen remained behind, no doubt because they would move faster than the infantry. They began to move out in the mid-afternoon. The commanders had unanimously agreed to follow Lorraine's advice and attack the city across the Wienerwald. It did not seem too great an obstacle from the maps that he had shown them, and none of the commanders had much detailed knowledge of their route. 
nor did Lorraine, until he personally scouted some approaches to the ridge of the Wienerwald after the advance began. In 1683, the whole area was a wilderness, unmapped, and since 1493, when the Emperor Maximilian had banned further settlement within it, mostly uninhabited except for a few hunters and woodcutters, stretching like a narrow peninsula of high ground from the eastern Alps to the Danube elbow west of Vienna, it was a huge, established forest of beech and oak, with scrubland on the steep slopes on the Vienna side. It had long provided the Viennese with firewood and a constant supply of game. The Habsburgs claimed rights over it as hunting domain, but since it had no palace or hunting lodge, it had gradually lost favor. Leopold certainly preferred the greater convenience of hunting grounds artificially stocked with game and with a fully equipped palace close at hand. On the Vienna side of the forest there was an easy slope upwards which was covered with vineyards and small villages. Higher up the slope became much steeper and was fissured with streams and little valleys. Along the ridge which ran from the Danube to the southwest the woods were dense and where there were no trees the undergrowth grew profusely. There were a few buildings on the highest knoll with an old monastery by 1683 falling into ruin. When it rained, the numerous brooks filled with water, pouring down the hillsides in white torrents. Just before the Danube, studded at intervals along a ridge about six miles long, was a set of named high points, landmarks, from the Ruskopf, farthest away to the southeast, to the highest, the Hermannskogel, at a little over 1,700 feet, running along to the last, the Kallenberg, about 1,300 feet, towering over the Danube below. Next to the Kallenberg was another hilltop, rather prosaically known as the Sauberg, or Sau Mountain, from the herds of wild pigs that roamed there, living off the acorns from the oak trees. This peak was bought in 1628 by the Emperor Ferdinand II from the monks of Cloister Neuburg. He promptly renamed it the Josephsburg, and built a small monastery dedicated to the saint. Lorraine discovered from Colonel Heisler that a few Turks had occupied the two high points at the end of the ridge, but only as observation posts. They had recently dug some ditches and might be about to strengthen the position further. It was fortunate that the Ottomans had not occupied the ridge and built field fortifications. Even a few musketeers well entrenched there would have wrought havoc. By dusk, the infantry and German cavalry had encamped by the little town of St. Andra on the western edge of the Wienerwald, and the Polish force, arriving late in the day, bivouacked a few miles to the west. The commanders met and agreed their final plan for attack. They drew up the battle plans, how each unit would relate to its neighbors, how they would maneuver in the assault, even where the artillery would be placed. They agreed that the relief army should occupy the whole six-mile front from the Kallenberg southwestwards to the Ruskopf. Most European battles were then fought on flat or rolling countryside, and the problems of maneuvering so many men through a forest, up steep slopes, over so long a front were barely understood. The ridges were not especially high, and there were pathways to the summit, but none was suitable for many thousands of men. Perhaps the caution of Leopold and his military advisers in Passau had not been as foolish as it had seemed to Lorraine and the other commanders. The entire army had to struggle up one long slope covered with scrub and small trees, descend into the valley beyond, and then climb the other side of the valley to the top of the line of hills on the next, and then finally fight a battle. The huge Polish cavalry force suffered most. Psychologically, they would be the key component of the battle. As they toiled up the long slope of the mountain, at first riding their horses, and after they dismounted, stumbling on the loose, stony ground, the mass of men thinned out, and the lines grew longer and longer. As they advanced out of the valley of the Hagen River, only two miles from where they had started, the terrain became even worse, with huge boulders and shale on the ground, and later narrow clefts in the rock, through which only one or two horses could pass at a time. It was well after nightfall before the advance guard arrived at the agreed mustering point, with an additional demanding climb the following day. 
As the whole army gathered beyond the first line of foothills in the deep valley cut by the Vidling River, a small group of volunteer Savoyard mountain troops, with the young Prince Eugene and some musketeers, were sent ahead on the evening of 10 September. Their task, guided by local hunters, was to find their way up the maze of forest pathways to the summit of the Kallenberg Ridge. Once it was dark, they were to capture the Turkish outposts on the Kallenberg in a sudden night attack. By dawn on Saturday, 11 September, they had surprised the small Ottoman outpost and slaughtered all the Turks they could find. But some of the Ottoman force slipped away in the dark, returning to the main Turkish camp on the plain below, bearing news of the impending attack. By 11 in the morning, the main body of the Austrian and German troops had arrived along the ridge. They made camp on the slopes of the three peaks, the Kallenberg, the Vogelsangberg, and the Hermannskogel, company by company, in accordance with the field orders. Closest to the Danube on the Kallenberg were the Austrian troops of Charles of Lorraine. Next to them, below the summit of the Vogelsgangberg, were the contingents from the Holy Roman Empire under Waldeck, and then the Saxons under the direct command of Julius Francis, Duke of Lauenburg, covering the lower slopes of the Hermannskogel. When the Poles arrived on the ridge, they took up position on the slopes below the last three hilltops, farthest from the river, the Dreimachstein, the Greinberg, and the Roskopf. All this activity could be seen by the observers in the cathedral tower in the city below, and by the Turks in their camp. The camps along the ridge were laid out in lines, corresponding to the plan of attack. But when Charles of Lorraine and King John Sobieski rode up to the vantage point on the Kallenberg, it became clear that the maps they had used and the reality of the terrain were very different. The maps had presented a set of flat, open, rectangular fields below the hills, even showing the neat lines of the plow. What they saw below them was a much riskier prospect. There was not a slope running smoothly down towards the city, but a pockmarked rocky landscape enfolded into a succession of clefts and ridges. There were little villages clustered amid the fields. The fields were not flat, but steeply sloping, and often bounded by stone walls, thick hedgerows, or dense scrub. Worst of all, the descent was precipitous. Most of the crops were not grain, but grapevines, growing rampantly entangled, heavily laden with swollen fruit. It was only a few weeks before they would be picked. Most were strung on long hurdles woven from withies, but where the land was pitted with fissures, they often snaked along the ground. Through the fields were little gulches with fast-flowing streams tumbling down towards the Danube after the rains, and larger, deeper ravines cut by small rivers also heading towards the Danube. Below the fields was a string of villages which survived on the wine that they produced. It was difficult ground for infantry, but for cavalry it might be murderous. Tall on their horses, Sobieski's Husaria, slowly picking their way downhill, would be perfect targets for Ottoman marksmen. They could be wiped out long before they were in a position to launch a charge. The only hope was strong support from musketeers who could exchange fire with the Ottomans, and Sobieski had few of these. He demanded that some of the best German infantry should reinforce his men, and Lorraine immediately agreed. As they looked at the ground, both men realized that this would not be the battle that they had anticipated. They might outnumber the enemy. They were fresh, and they had been spiritually and psychologically reinforced by the sermons of their preachers and the body of Christ. But the ground favored the Ottoman defenders, who could set up a succession of ambushes and close encounters. Here, a flight of arrows could be as deadly as a musket volley, and the lighter Turkish horses were better adapted to the rough terrain than the sturdier German or Polish chargers. In tactical terms, then, it threatened disaster. Neither pikemen nor musketeers could advance in line, weapons at the ready, as the commander's plan proposed. At best, groups of men could scramble down over rocks and other obstacles, halt, reform, and move on again. There was no possibility of sophisticated maneuver. Then, each village beyond the vine-laden fields could be made into a strong point by the Turks. Field fortifications or trenches could join one village to the next. Ottoman musketeers or gunners could pick off the relief army as it stumbled down the hill, with little in the way of effective cover. 
It was also exceptionally and insufferably hot, and the sudden storms did little to break the oppressive, sultry atmosphere. The generals might command and throw the dice of war, but the reality of the forthcoming battle would be controlled entirely by the company officers and the sergeants. Yet the objective was clear. The city below them and the sea of Ottoman tents surrounding it. With a telescope, the spider's web of trenches leading to the walls and the damage inflicted on the defenses were clearly visible. They could also watch, as the morning wore on, the Ottoman response to the unexpected presence of the relieving army. Prisoners taken by Ottoman patrols revealed that an army was assembling north of the Danube. And on 9 September, Kara Mustafa learned that they had crossed the river and had camped on the plain before Tun. The size of this army was rumored to be huge, with most of the infidel world contributing to it. A council of war had been summoned to the Grand Vizier's tent for the morning of 10 September. It was decided that the siege should continue, but that the bulk of the cavalry still waiting idly in camp around the city should move to face the new challenge. Meanwhile, the Grand Vizier had summoned reserves from Hungary, both infantry and cavalry, and fresh supplies, which arrived as the meeting was taking place. The enemy was coming, and the assault on the Kallenberg outpost confirmed that this would be the line of attack. None of the Tartar scouts reported any movement to the south. Kara Mustafa rode out with his commanders and began a slow sweep across the whole front below the Dreimarkstein peak to the Danube, close to the Kallenberg. To all of them it seemed most likely that the attack would center on the area close to the Danube, where the road approached from the great abbey of Kloster Neuburg, and then pushed down through the villages of Nussdorf, Heiligenstadt, Unterdöbling, and Oberdöbling. The plan was simple and logical. Their main defensive position would be on the ridge above the village of Oberdöbling, with the ground above the villages of Weinhaus and Gersthof strengthened with field fortifications. An advanced detachment of 5,400 under an experienced commander, Kara Mehmed, Pasha of Diyarbakir, moved quickly uphill and turned Nussdorf into a strong point. Further to the Ottoman left, a small force covered the less likely line of approach from the heights below the Roskopf peak. The front was so extended that Kara Mustafa could not defend in equal strength all along the line, and he relied on Tartars and camped on the far left of his positions to provide emergency cover. Each of the strong points was equipped with artillery, some 60 cannon in all, stripped out of the batteries facing Vienna. Those in the city began to notice a lightning in the bombardment. Nowhere did the Turks attempt to construct any kind of defensive wall, even if made only from gabions and rough timber. Marsili, watching the events take place, was mystified. He wrote admiringly of the way in which the Ottomans had managed their siege of the city, but wondered why, with all those skills, they made no attempt to provide protection for the infantry and cavalry as the relief army approached. A few palanka were quickly thrown together from materials to hand. At Nussdorf, entrenchments on the high ground between the villages, even an impromptu palisade of sharpened stakes, would have strengthened the Ottoman position immeasurably. Nonetheless, Kara Mustafa reinforced the cavalry holding the new positions by drawing off janissaries from the trenches before the city, as well as the new arrivals from Hungary under the command of the 80-year-old Ibrahim, Pasha of Buda. The Grand Vizier, whose experience of war had been largely restricted to sieges, had little of the elderly Pasha's military instincts, gained in a career spent fighting and raiding in the hilly country of the Hungarian borderlands. But Kara Mustafa regarded Ibrahim with deep mistrust, and although he had placed him in command of this key flank, allowed him little discretion as to how he blocked the enemy advance. In theory, the Ottoman defense was very sound. A succession of strong points, from the summit of the Nussberg Hill below the heights of Kallenberg, then the strongly defended village of Nussdorf on the reverse side of the slope. If the enemy took Nussdorf, the Danube lay ahead, so the Christian army would have to veer to the right and into the little gorge cut by the Schreiberbach. All this time it would be under fire from the occupied village to Heiligenstadt ahead, and beyond was the defended ridge above the two villages of Unterdöbling and Oberdöbling, packed with cannon and musketeers, where the bulk of the Turks were marshaled. 
Before the ridge lay another stream, the Erbsenbach, with steep sides and more than 10 feet deep at some points. The Habsburg and German infantry would have to fight all the way down over fields, vineyards, and rough ground, over all the rivers and many streams flowing down the slope towards the Danube and across the line of advance. The steep slope of the land made it difficult for the relief army to maneuver to left or right, and at each point channeled it back onto the Ottoman defenses. It was a sequence of fire zones constructed by nature and strengthened by man's malign artifice. Away to the west, there were fewer watercourses and more open ground, and there Kara Mustafa relied on his superiority in cavalry. Moreover, there was no sign of any activity in the hills to the west of the city. There was indeed nothing to see, for the Poles did not arrive on the crest after a terrible struggle uphill until after nightfall on 11 September. As Kara Mustafa watched the ant-like activity of the Christian army on the Kallenberg, the emplacement of gun batteries and signs of movement, he was certain that this was where the attack would come, and rejoiced. He pushed more and more men into the positions facing the expected assault. He sent some of his personal forces to take up position above the village of Gersthof, on the steep bluff still known as the Turkenschanz, the Turks' redoubt. 5 a.m. Dawn on the Kallenberg. Charles of Lorraine had been out in the early hours of Sunday, 12 September, without eating and without sleeping, as the emperor's closest confidant and the chaplain to the army, Father Marco Daviano, wrote to the emperor Leopold. The Ottoman advance guard, commanded by Kara Mehmed, had taken possession of Nussdorf, and the Pasha had sent small groups of musketeers further up the hill during 11 September, in plain sight of those on the Kallenberg. Lorraine told the gunners to target Nussdorf, but at about 5 a.m., the Turkish skirmishers, who had crept very close in the night, opened fire sporadically from behind a small rise of ground, and with more success from behind a sturdy fence further down the slope. The heavy Turkish muskets outranged the lighter Austrian weapons, and it was easier to shoot accurately uphill than down. Men began dropping, dead or wounded. The Habsburg troops hurriedly formed their two battalions into two lines, one behind the other, and began to advance down the hill towards their tormentors. In the front rank they bore a huge white flag emblazoned with a scarlet cross, clearly visible in the bright dawn from the walls of Vienna, and most of them had taken communion very early in the day. This was the avenging army of Christ crucified. They quickly overwhelmed the skirmishers and carried on moving slowly forward. Behind and away to their right, the contingents from the empire saw what was happening but stood firm. Then the Saxons, closer to the Habsburg contingent, formed up and began to descend the slope. In the space of an hour, the left flank of the relief army had begun to move downhill. Far above them, on the high point of the Kallenberg, Lorraine was alarmed as he saw them move off. This was not his plan. He had to act decisively if he were to regain control of the action. At 8 a.m., he ordered his dragoons and the final Saxon regiment to move quickly down to block any Turkish attack up from Nussdorf along the Danube side of the battle with the hope of outflanking the Habsburg troops. Simultaneously, he dispatched a series of gallopers with orders to slow the advance of the Habsburg infantry, also sending the last of his foot, the Bavarians and the remaining imperial contingents, to move down to support them. Eventually, at about 10 a.m., the advance paused on the lower slopes of the Nussberg Hill and began to take heavy enemy fire. The entire hillside was alive with men. The Ottoman master of ceremonies later wrote in his diary for the early morning of 12 September that a huge army of the Jews, Christians, was advancing upon the Ottoman camp. It looked as if a flood of black pitch was pouring downhill, crushing and burning everything that opposed it. Thus they attacked in the vain hope of encircling the fighters of Islam from both sides. 10 a.m. It was a vain hope, because the impetuous advance followed the course that the Turkish commanders had anticipated. The Turks were outnumbered by the army moving steadily down the hill, but they had cannon and well-chosen positions. Still, the battle did not go as the Ottomans anticipated. 
Soon the Saxons' light guns were pulled down the hillside by their gunners, and the army before Nussdorf soon had cannon positioned in support. After a hard fight and taking casualties, the Christian forces stormed the crown of the Nussberg and directed their artillery fire down into the Ottoman-occupied village. The Ottomans, more used to facing Christians who broke and ran before them, were now confronted by men who fought like demons, constantly pushing forward, sometimes firing in unison, sometimes picking their individual targets. The Ottomans despised those who lacked the courage to fight like them, but these were soldiers who would close with them, driven, it seemed, by a divine anger, shouting and screaming the words of the day, Jesus Maria, against the Ottoman cries of Allah, Allah. Allah. Watching from a distance, and certain that this was the decisive moment, Kara Mustafa ordered his strategic reserve forward, and he himself moved with all his remaining bodyguard and household troops to the prepared positions on the Turkenschanz. There he set up the standard of the Prophet in front of a scarlet tent as a rallying point. By eleven in the morning, five hours after the battle had begun, Lorraine succeeded in keeping his various units in line and together, a near impossible task with the rivers and streams running in deep crevasses, making it impossible to move forward with anything more than an appearance of synchronicity. Any mistake made, any gap that opened in the line, was immediately attacked by the Ottomans with speed and fierce elan. The Turks were now committed to the ferocious battle with the Habsburg and Imperial forces on a line from Varing village to a position close to the channel of the Danube that led down to Vienna. Kara Mustafa had literally turned his back to the inactive front close to his great tented enclosure and in front of it the trenches attacking the city walls. No general had given the order to start the battle, but it had begun nonetheless. If it was to be won, then all the commanders needed to keep control of the action on the ground. Once Lorraine had set the army in motion, he rode off at speed to meet the King of Poland. The Poles had arrived under cover of darkness and had assembled in battle order, covering the ground below the Dreimarkstein and the Roskopf peaks. Both parts of the relief army were in position. They had, as far as was possible under the conditions, decided on a common plan, which reflected the reality on the ground. Sobieski would command the attack of the right wing, while Lorraine would push his men forward to a decisive encounter with the Grand Vizier, positioned around the standard of the Prophet. In contrast, Kara Mustafa had abandoned any attempt to coordinate his pashas in front of the Ottoman camp, or the Tartars in their camp to the southwest. No field fortifications were created or any kind of defensive lines established. The great war camp was completely open to attack from the Wienerwald. Before noon, the Habsburg advance steadily converged on the newly fortified village of Nussdorf, while the Saxons pushed down the little Muckenthal Valley towards the strongly defended village of Heiligenstadt. The Ottomans immediately counterattacked, with Kara Mustafa's household troops swelling their ranks, and there was savage hand-to-hand -hand fighting all along the line, with the more numerous Ottoman cavalry pressing hard into any gap. Lorraine's cuirassiers and the Saxon cavalry under John George, the elector of Saxony, held back behind the line of infantry, then surged forward to join the fight, striking the Sipahis at a fast trot. Nussberg finally fell to the Christians after a house-to-house -house battle, but then the Saxons were driven back. They regrouped and charged down again to take the second Ottoman strongpoint. With both Nussdorf and Heiligenstadt securely in his hands, and the Turks concentrated in their redoubt above the two villages of Upper and Lower Döbling, Lorraine called a halt at some time after noon. The sun was blazing down, the men had had nothing to eat and little water since dawn, and an uneasy stillness descended on the battlefront. The battle cries of both sides had ceased. There was considerable movement atop the Ottoman strong point, but no cannon fire. The relief army had taken all the villages, Neustift, Sievering, Grinzing, and nearly down to the Turkenschanz, where the Grand Vizier had planted his flag. But the Ottoman defense line still blocked any closer advance on the city, which might fall at any moment. As the two front lines grew silent, the Christian soldiers in Nussdorf and Heiligenstadt were watching movements on the hills above them to the southwest. 
a cloud of dust from horses' hooves appeared above the ridge. The movement of nearly 20,000 cavalry was impossible to conceal. The Polish host was drawn up in three divisions. On the far right was Stanislav Jablonowski, one of the most renowned soldiers in the Polish host. He had fought the Swedes, Cossacks, Russians, Turks, and Tartars, and his support had ensured Sobieski's election as King of Poland in 1674. Next came the king himself, with his troops grouped on the slopes of the Granberg. To Sobieski's left, with his men lined up on the Roskopf, Nicholas Hieronymus Szenjewski, who had fought at Sobieski's side in earlier wars. These were all men whom the king could trust. In front of the horse were lines of Polish infantry, stiffened by the German musketeers and pikemen sent by Lorraine. Beside them were the 28 Polish cannons so laboriously dragged up the hill. Some were mounted at the foot of the Granberg to cover the advance of the army down the hill. Other field guns on wheeled carriages followed the horsemen down the hill and were placed to give close supporting fire. They were charged with case shot, designed to obliterate any infantry or cavalry that came within range. At about 1 p.m., King John III Sobieski led the army slowly downhill over the rough ground, to be followed by Jablonowski and Szenjewski with their columns, each taking a different route through the ravines and rough ground. Once Sobieski's men reached the Mikhailerberg directly below them at about 2 p.m., the Polish cavalry turned from a dust cloud into lines of armed men, visible to the Ottomans and the Habsburg and Imperial forces alike. From afar, it looked like a stately progress, but in reality the horses stumbled, a few broke their legs, and the gun carriages often lost their wheels. The three columns moved slowly downhill until the whole Polish army was lined up on flat and easy ground for cavalry. 2 p.m. The king was prepared to take a day or even two to secure a solid position from which to launch his attack. Ottoman sipahis and some infantry made vain attempts to impede their advance, and eventually, by about 4 p.m., Sobieski and Szenjewski's columns were drawn up in a long line stretching westwards from the village of Gersthof, past all the hills and foothills that led up to the Wienerwald. The Grand Vizier, on his velvet chair on the Turkenschanz, now watched a possible disaster unfolding before him. He faced the classic military dilemma. A double assault, with his defenses penetrated simultaneously from in front and behind. The huge Polish army could burst through behind him and cut him off from both Vienna and his line of retreat to Hungary. In front, he faced an implacable enemy who had demolished every line of defense his commanders had erected. His whole plan was void. His instinct was correct, to attack and disrupt both enemies, but he was not competent to carry out the complex maneuvers that it required. Nor was he at first aware that the third Polish column, led by Jablonowski, was still descending from the hills. His aim was to build a new front to the west of his current position, but he needed time to put it in place. It was a last vain hope. However, at that point, both Lorraine and Sobieski were faced with the same decision. Both had moved forward faster and farther than they had ever anticipated in the early morning. All their doubts and fears about the rugged terrain had proved unfounded. Now they had to decide whether they should go for the kill, to shatter the Turks in one final blow, or rest and deliver the final onslaught on the following day. Legends abound about the fateful decision. One has it that Lorraine assembled his weary officers and asked them which choice he should make. At first there was silence, and then an old Saxon general, von der Goltz, said that God was giving them this victory and they should fight on to accomplish what he had ordained for them. And besides, he added, he was an old man and fancied a comfortable bed in Vienna that night. This was the kind of soldierly bravado that appealed to Lorraine, so saying, we march on, he ordered the battle to be continued. On the other side of the battle line, quite independently, Sobieski had also decided that this was the moment to finish the enemy. Mid-afternoon. Both Lorraine and Sobieski's decisions were characteristic. It was the middle of the afternoon, but if they could not finish off the Turks by the time night fell, and there was no moon to speak of, the enemy might slip away or regroup. Worse still, 
Israel, the besiegers might take the city, from which they had no news other than the earlier report that they were expecting the worst. The Grand Vizier's entire strategy had been based on capturing Vienna. If his troops, still attacking the city, succeeded in breaking through at this last moment, he might pull his army back and, below the walls of his prize, fight out the denouement before a city over which the crescent of Islam had at last been raised on the great tower of the Steffel. Prudence might dictate that the Allies should wait, but the fear that a complete victory might be denied them weighed heavily. Just before 3.30 p.m., the Habsburg and Saxon assault started again all along the Ottoman defense line, which at first responded with great vigor. The Bavarian and Imperial troops, mostly from Franconia, began to bombard the Turkenschanz. By five, the Döbling villages had fallen, and Lorraine ordered the victorious soldiers, who had slaughtered every Turk they found, to concentrate on the Turkenschanz from the northern side. As they attacked, more than a mile away, but in clear view, the Poles began to launch a series of cavalry charges on the heart of the vast Ottoman encampment. Here, the defenders had massed their cannon and a large force of sipahis. The Polish tactic was to launch a trial charge with a detachment of Husaria and retainers, Choragiev, to test the enemy's metal and firepower. At about 4 p.m., the king ordered a charge by the Husaria Company, some 120 men, named after his infant son Alexander. They trotted off in the direction of the enemy, their black and gold pennant visible above the dust kicked up by the Ottoman gunfire and the horses' hooves. The charge itself was as Rakowski's reveille to worthy sons had put it in 1670. Over the horse's head lower your lance, charge forward, stroking the flying beast beneath you with the spur, and aim at the enemy's navel. The historian Vespasian Kochowski was present at the Battle for Vienna and published his commentary on the great victory in 1684. He described how, No sooner does the hussar lower his lance than a Turk is impaled upon its spike, which not only disorders, but terrifies the foe. That blow that cannot be defended against or deflected, oft transfixing two persons at a time. Others flee in eager haste from such a sight, like flies in a frenzy. Just before impact on the solid mass of Turks before them, each man dropped his lance point to make sure that it would bury itself in the entrails or the chest of the front rank before them. As the forlorn hope struck home, the sharp crack of the doomed horsemen's lances splintering could be heard above the noise of battle. Very few of the Husaria rode out again, but the king deemed the trial a great success, and he prepared a full advance of all three columns into the heart of the Ottoman camp. By now the Grand Vizier had already abandoned his position on the Turkenschanz and ridden to his great tent in the main encampment, carrying the standard of the Prophet with him. The Turks left behind watched his departure, then abandoned their own positions on the bluff and began to flee. Soon thousands of Turks were riding or running back, not into the battle between the Poles and the Ottomans for possession of the camp, but past the line of tents and beyond the struggle towards the high road into Hungary. 6 p.m. The Poles prepared to launch their final attack just before 6 p.m. King John Sobieski had at his disposal almost 3,000 hussars, and probably double that number of other horsemen, some of their riders in chain mail and others less heavily armored. They were grouped close together in solid squares, hussars with their retinue and supporters massed behind them. It is often said that this mass charge had little effect and was more a grand, valorous display than an effective tactic. But on 12 September 1683, the Poles did not face western pikemen or well-disciplined musketeers. Before them was a huge mass of Ottoman cavalry and some infantry, demoralized and with no space left in which to maneuver. All this was apparent to the Grand Vizier in his tented enclosure. He had seen and heard the first assault by the Poles, and he watched as their squadrons in three great columns stopped and then moved laterally, slowly spreading across the flat ground. They formed up into the traditional pattern of a Polish army just before the charge. Every company was a compact block, every hussar in the front line a little more than a sword's length from his neighbor, his lance held vertical. Behind them was the mass of his retainers, their sabers drawn, or some preferring the long straight Polish concerts, more lance than sword. 
On each side of the company, ranks of musketeers flanked the horsemen. It was a terrifying sight for the Turks expecting their charge. The Poles' power and weight were devastating against men in the open field, cavalry or infantry. They were much less effective against an enemy entrenched behind field fortifications with cannon in support. The Turks' best hope was to tempt the Poles to attack a defended position. Anything would do. Wagons yoked together, a line of spiked palisades with muskets and artillery behind. This was the tactic that had destroyed the Hungarian chivalry at the Battle of Mohacs in 1526. The chivalry of Hungary was shot to pieces by the Janissaries and the Turkish guns, protected by sharpened stakes from Hungarian swords and lances. But in the heat of the day on 12 September, for never was there a hotter day known than this, no preparations had been made. The camp before Vienna was full of beams, gabions, wooden stakes and the like, yet none were put to use. This oversight, indolence or mere carelessness, cost the Turks dearly. They faced the Polish host out in the open, lined up before their tents. These Polish horsemen in their burnished steel breastplates moved more like well-drilled automata, terrifying in their appearance. They took up their positions on command and halted. They moved forward and waited. On Sobieski's order, perhaps between 5,000 and 9,000 horsemen, with the Husaria in front, made ready to charge the Turkish host. But about that moment, the final and most dramatic of Polish chivalry, contemporaries are silent as to the detail. Dalerats, in his secret history, says, Everything happened as he supposed. The hussars of Prince Alexander fell upon the main body of the Grand Vizier, routed them, and in that instant the whole army of the enemy retreated without making any resistance. The mere threat of this vast mounted army seemed to break the spirit of the Ottomans before them. The metal of the Husaria, their forlorn hope of little more than a hundred men charging recklessly into the much larger body of Ottoman horse and janissaries, was a display of courage that immensely impressed the Turks. In the same way that Miklos Zrinyi's storming out of Shigetvar to his death in 1566 had become legendary among the Sultan's trained regiments. Thus, when Sobieski's cavalry army, stretching almost as far as the eye could see, and many times larger than the little detachment of hussars who had driven into the heart of the Ottoman host, began to stir and make ready to charge, the Turks believed the battle lost. They abandoned the camp and fled. Some Ottomans blundered into the flank of Yablonovsky's hussars and attacked them fiercely, but soon they broke off the engagement to resume their flight. The great victory, so complete and so happy, cost but very few men. The second lines were no more than spectators, because the enemy fled before they were come up, so that none but only the dragoons, the infantry, and the hussars bore the fire and engaged the enemy. As he heard the small group of hussars charge home, Kara Mustafa left his tent to rejoin the fight, charging into the flank of Yablonovsky's column. Most of his bodyguard was killed, and he had been told that if he were captured, the sacred standard entrusted to him by the sultan would fall into infidel hands. He returned to his tent for the last time, wrapped the standard in its cover, took his private treasure chest, and rode off with a few sipahis towards the safety of Hungary. His final official act was to order the troops besieging Vienna to leave their posts, destroying anything that might be useful to the enemy, and to slaughter all captives. All three orders were carried out as far as was possible in the final chaotic hour. The Polish hussars, many abandoning their clumsy lances for their sabers hanging from their wrists, plunged forward as the enemy began to flee. Their discipline allowed them to wreak enormous havoc on a disorganized and dispirited enemy. They slashed at the backs of the retreating sipahis, sometimes having to fight hard against those Turks who turned and fought back with desperate zeal. But most of the Ottoman troops simply wanted to escape. The Poles harried them for a short distance, but seeing that they were not going to return to the fight, let them continue and moved back to take control of the vast camp. Thus, twelve hours after the battle had begun in confusion, it ended in chaos, with complete victory for the relief army. Lorraine, now in the Turkenschanz, sent a messenger to the city with the news which was already obvious from the city walls. Vienna had been relieved.
Starenberg and all the dignitaries of the city, plus a huge crowd of the citizens and refugees, received him at the Scottish Gate. The first part of the army to enter the city was led by Ludwig Wilhelm, Margrave of Baden-Baden, and his dragoons, riding to the happy tune of kettle drums and trumpets. Von der Goltz had to spend another night under canvas. The Poles and other parts of the relief army stayed awake in case the Turks returned. An old trick. But by 10 p.m. it was clear they had gone for good. Vienna and Christendom had been saved. 9. A Holy War When dawn broke on Monday, 13 September 1683, the Turkish host had already vanished. A few unfortunate miners stumbling up from the underground workings before the walls, oblivious of time and the transformation of events, were taken prisoner and quickly slaughtered. The Ottomans had left behind a ghost city of tents, a vast camp that was pillaged and repillaged. Overnight, the Polish cavalry had taken the first cut, and then in the morning the Habsburg and Imperial forces took what was left as their share. The Viennese swarmed out from the fetid city and snatched what remained. A half-truth was that they found bags of small beans, coffee, that were used to establish the first of Vienna's coffee houses. Rumor had it that Georg Franz Kolschitsky, whose exploits carrying messages through the Turkish lines had made him a hero of the siege, knew what these nondescript goods were and secured the right to establish the first coffee shop in the city. This was a fiction put about by Kolschitsky, who wanted a new monopoly for his own coffee house. It now seems that an Armenian, Johannes Diodato, is a more likely candidate. But the men had something in common. Both spoke Ottoman Turkish. Both moved freely and easily between the cultures of West and East. The coffee house legend illustrates a facet of Vienna obscured in the exultation of triumph. The city, like almost any frontier town, had commercial connections across the national border, usually carried out by intermediaries. Many of those expelled from the city or killed at the beginning of the siege were Turks, outsiders from the lands east of royal Hungary, but Christians or Jews, and not Muslims. Vienna had been the bastion of the West against the Ottoman East for centuries, but it was also a point of contact with the East. Certainly, a long history of fear and hostility dominated popular attitudes. The old tale of Ottoman captivity written by Johannes Schildberger was one of the most successful medieval texts to be printed in German and was still widely read in the 17th century. Schildberger told a graphic story of the crusade of Nicopolis and the battle in which he had been captured. It was fought in September 1396, and afterwards the Ottoman Sultan had watched as the defeated chivalry of Europe were decapitated one by one in revenge for the Turks killed when the crusaders had taken Nicopolis. The story of Hans, Lord of Greif, made him a hero for future generations. I saw the Lord Greif, who was a noble of Bavaria, and four others bound with the same cord. When he saw the great revenge that was taking place, he cried with a loud voice and consoled the horsemen and foot soldiers who were standing there to die. Stand firm, he said. When our blood this day is spilt for the Christian faith, we by God's help shall become the children of heaven. When he said this, he knelt and was beheaded together with his companions. Blood was spilled from morning until vespers, and when the Turkish king's counselors saw that so much blood was spilled and that still it would not stop, they rose and fell upon their knees before the king and entreated him for the sake of God that he would forget his rage, that he might not draw down upon himself the vengeance of God as enough blood was already spilled. He consented and ordered that they should stop. Nicopolis was not the humiliating last episode in the medieval crusades which had begun in 1099 with the capture of Jerusalem. It was the beginning of a new cycle of war, centered in Europe and the Mediterranean rather than the Holy Land. The first confrontation with a new enemy even more deadly than Christendom's earlier foes. The Kurdish Sultan Saladin had taken Jerusalem from the Crusaders in 1186. A Mamluk slave from Egypt, Sultan Baybars, had driven the last of them from Palestine in 1268. 
But the Ottoman Sultan Bayezid had dealt an even more crushing blow, annihilating the new crusaders within sight of the Danube. The horror of Nicopolis was not forgotten. Many of the old crusading narratives were printed and republished. Europe itself was now in the front line, and after the abortive siege of Vienna in 1529, the city became known as the forward bulwark of the Christian world. The fear that one day this bulwark would fall, and Europe with it, became a serious, if latent, fear. Now the feared Ottoman host had been trounced, and there was a widespread call for a renewed crusade that could conquer the lands lost to the Turks since 1453. At last, a reconquest seemed a real possibility. This hope was not just an outcome of the adventitious circumstances of 1683, but the fulfillment of a deep desire in the Western Catholic world. For almost three centuries, a succession of impassioned scholars had written and preached the message of holy war, usually, however, to deaf ears. Occasionally there were successes, as at Lepanto, but normally the rulers of Europe failed to combine in the great common goal. Crusading was a collective endeavor, and it depended upon the strong and active leadership of the papacy. Very few popes considered it much more than a theoretical obligation, for they had more substantial fish to fry. But short-lived holy leagues had been created under papal guidance. Not all were victorious. The league formed in 1538 was demolished by the decisive Ottoman naval victory over its ships off Preveza in northwest Greece. A second league created in 1570-71 was more successful, leading to an equally emphatic Christian victory at Lepanto. But these encounters had little effect in the long run and no one attempted the far harder task of uniting Christendom for a land war against the Turks. In the 17th century, the emergencies of 1664 and of 1683 revived the idea of a holy war on land. It was perhaps the last act of a temporarily united Christendom, for both Catholics and Protestants felt threatened and participated actively against the common enemy. It was papal money that provided the essential lubricant of these occasional alliances, and Pope Innocent XI was prepared to lavish huge amounts on the war to expel Islam from formerly Christian-ruled lands. The Emperor Leopold was sedulously devoted to the cult of his ancestors, and in the days after this sudden triumph before Vienna, he began to feel that destiny had settled upon his shoulders. He was being called to fulfill a God-given mission, to complete the recovery of Christian lands which his ancestors had begun a century before in Spain. Leopold I was not an impulsive man, but on every side he heard the same seductive siren voices. He read voraciously, and in his court library were books like the popular work of a Capuchin monk, Michel Fabure, L'État présent de la Turquie, published in 1675. This was written in Italian and translated into French, Spanish, and German. Fabure's line was that all empires fall into decadence, and this is Turkey's moment. In 1675, he followed with a second book, Théâtre de la Turquie, shamelessly dedicated to the French minister of war, Louvois, in the hope of his patronage and support. His equally impassioned contemporary, Father Jean Copin, born about 1615, served as a cavalry officer under Louis XIII and was then successively a traveler in Egypt and North Africa, soldier of fortune, and finally the French consul in Demetia from 1644. After he returned to France in 1647, he became a Catholic priest and an impassioned advocate of the idea of a holy war. None of the clergy, or Louvois, showed the remotest interest in his project. Copin retired to his parish at Le Puy and gave up hope of the great struggle. The victory at Vienna roused him to publish his old proposal, Le Bouclier de l'Europe et la Guerre Sainte, The Shield of Europe and the Holy War. It first appeared in his hometown and was picked up by an enterprising printer in Lyon and then republished in Paris in 1686. Copies spread rapidly across Europe. As a former soldier, Copin illustrated his book with sketches of the sort of military formations and tactics that could defeat the Turk, as well as a lengthy account of his travels and experiences in the Eastern world 40 years before. His argument was simple. The Turk has in these last two years received very considerable losses, as never before since the establishment of their tyranny. 
occasion for attacking this infidel's people might never be more favorable. Unquestionably, this was Pope Innocent XI's firm view, and he promised to finance the crusade on the same scale that he had supported the relief of Vienna. But regardless of the costs of a war of reconquest, Leopold was faced with a pragmatic dilemma. He was the emperor of the German nation, and the empire was faced with a real and deadly threat from the most Christian king of France. France was intent on achieving a dramatic realignment of his border from the Channel to the Danube, encroaching both on the states and free cities of Germany and on the rich Habsburg territories in the Low Countries. In terms of power and money, the Habsburg dynasty had more to lose by neglecting its western lands than it could possibly gain in the vast Hungarian void which it had never previously occupied. After the relief of Vienna, two options lay before the emperor. One supposed that the Ottomans had suffered such losses before Vienna in 1683 that it might be another century and a half before they tried their luck again, if indeed they ever advanced so far. The other offered a forward policy in the East, the God-given option. This debate between those who would later be called the Westerners, who favored abandoning conquest in the East, and the Easterners, who wanted to advance into Hungary and beyond, was eventually decided by Leopold in favor of the Eastern, God-given strategy. There is little doubt that piety played a large part in his decision, but even stronger was his sense of his own heritage. His ancestor, the Emperor Charles V, had confronted Islam in person with his campaign against Tunis, celebrated in a series of vast tapestries, now in Vienna's Kunsthistorisches Museum. The Emperor Leopold was conscious of the Catholic King's completion of the reconquest in Spain, and now he was offered the chance to recover land from Islam on a vaster scale than had ever before been offered to his family. It was not wholly impossible that Constantinople itself might be recovered. The old, universal Roman Empire might be restored anew. While campaigning in the West might bring political gain, it did not offer the sublime benefits of honor and reputation that a victorious campaign in the East might deliver. The Emperor Leopold was an ardent, true believer, but he was not a fanatic, and although the call to a holy war held an emotional attraction, his ultimate decision would be political and pragmatic. On the day after the victory at Vienna, King John Sobieski entered the city and mounted an impromptu procession with the Grand Vizier's horse led behind him and the Turkish Tuj and the Ottoman banners carried aloft as in a Roman triumph. As the cavalcade passed the main churches of the city, crowds roared their approbation and gratitude. Later in the day, he wrote to his wife, cries and acclamations reached the sky of long live the King of Poland. At the dinner Starenberg gave for the king later in the day, the all-pervasive stench of the rotting bodies in the streets overlaid the more subtle tastes of the food and wine, and the Polish party retired early to the Grand Vizier's tent outside the walls, where Sobieski wrote letters announcing the triumph to the other rulers of Europe, beginning each one with a phrase echoing Julius Caesar, We came, we saw, and ending piously, God conquered. He sent a large embroidered Ottoman banner, which he believed was the flag of the Prophet Muhammad, by the hands of his secretary, to the Pope in Rome. Then, on the following morning, overpowered by the filth and flies in the Ottoman encampment, the Poles decamped to the outlying village of Shvekat. In the days after battle, sickness and epidemic disease began to spread through the victorious army. Even princes and generals were overcome by the effects of dysentery and by other myriad fluxes and took to their beds. The Prince of Waldeck was struck down, indisposed by a sudden gastric effusion while waiting for an audience with the Emperor. Leopold arrived on the day following Sobieski's victory march after sailing down the Danube. Met by Starenberg, he had inspected the empty Ottoman camp and then the damage to the city. His palace was in ruins, with almost every room devastated by Turkish gunfire, so that the imperial party was forced to bed down in the Stahlburg, the grandiose imperial stable block behind the Hofburg. There the emperor received his commanders and guests, held a banquet, and then rode out on the following morning, 15 September, to greet the Polish king at his new encampment. He was formal and unemotional towards Sobieski and his son, which some of the Poles read as a lack of gratitude and a snub for all their efforts. The king certainly believed it, as he angrily wrote to his wife that evening. 
In the intoxication of victory, no one anticipated a war of conquest that would last for 16 years, still less a succession of wars that would not be ended for more than 100 years. In the heady days following the relief of Vienna, there was little planning and no sober thinking about what a reconquest might demand. The lure of a vast empire in the east first gripped the previously level-headed Lorraine and then the king of Poland. Both had convinced themselves that after saving the capital, the Ottoman lands were there for the taking. Hungary, certainly, perhaps the entire Balkans. On 17 September, chafing at the emperor's reluctance to order an advance, the Poles broke camp and began to march east. Sobieski had a wild idea of heading straight for Buda, while Lorraine's contingents followed reluctantly in their wake. Around Vienna, the Bavarians and the German troops were still uncommitted, and some detachments, like the Saxons, were already heading home. The first thought was hot pursuit, chasing the fleeing Ottoman army, only a few days away and in almost total chaos. This was also the easiest option, for nearly all the Christian troops were on the southern side of the Danube. But the most tempting targets were north of the river. Here were rich lands where the Allied armies might find winter quarters while on the southern side of the Danube, most villages had been stripped bare of any morsel of food, and most of the houses burned. North of the river were the Turkish fortresses like Nove Zamki, which still threatened a defensive line protecting Vienna. So Sobieski and Lorraine decided to move north. They halted opposite Bratislava, and impatiently waited for the engineers to assemble the bridge of boats that would allow them and their hussars, cuirassiers, and dragoons to cross the Danube. But the pontoons and the skilled engineers were still far upriver at Thun, exactly at the point where the advancing army had left them before the relief of Vienna. It took ten days for the little flotilla to sail down the river to Bratislava, and two more days for the barges to be lashed together and planked over to link the northern to the southern shore. On 27 September, Lorraine's cavalry and the Polish horse clattered across into Upper Hungary and, giving the marshy lands by the Danube a wide berth, trotted off northeastwards. At every stage in the reconquest of Hungary during the 17th and 18th centuries, the narrative at some point returns to rivers and marshland. This image of a land dominated and divided by water first emerged in the ancient mythology of Hungary, as the first tribes had traveled from Scythia in the distant east to the Atilkus, the land of the great river. They were led by Almos, the Magyar Adam, who acquired his name because in a vision his mother had seen the Turul, a gigantic bird of prey, which descended from heaven on her and made her fertile. A great spring welled forth from her womb and began flowing westward. It grew and grew until it became a torrent which swept over the snow-covered mountains into the beautiful lowlands on the other side. There the waters stopped, and from the water grew a wondrous tree with golden branches. She imagined famed kings were to be born from her descendants, who shall rule not here in their present lands, but over that distant land in her dreams, surrounded with tall mountains. The pen of Luigi Fernandino, Count Marsili, transmuted this myth of Hungary's origins into science. In the autumn of 1683, he was, though still a slave, being carried back with the retreating Ottomans, making notes on their hectic retreat. But in later years, Marsili, whose life had been dominated as soldier, engineer, and scholar with the idea of Hungary, presented the whole of this watery world in six vast volumes, from the fish that swam in its waters to the birds that lived in the surrounding marshes and the ancient peoples who had dwelt along its banks and tributaries. Hungary was different in almost every way from the lands to the west, and the war of conquest was similarly different from any campaign fought by a western army. The Austrians and the Poles might be used to skirmishing along their frontiers with the Ottoman lands, but neither had any real notion of what it would be like to fight in the vast Hungarian hinterland. On the northern side of the Danube, beyond the well-defended Habsburg fortress of Komarno, lay a no-man's land. There was only one bridge across the Danube before the capital, Buda, built on the great bend of the Danube that turned the river's flow sharply southwards towards Belgrade. 
This bridge joined the well-garrisoned Ottoman Palanka of Barkan on the northern bank and the ancient Hungarian city of Estergom, Gran, on the southern side. Estergom's citadel was built upon the massive rock above the walled town below. Ottomans and Habsburgs had struggled for possession ever since the city was first conquered by Sultan Suleiman I in 1543, although it took him two years of bitter fighting to take the fortress. Once across the river, Buda was little more than 30 miles away, only a few days easy march. Sobieski and Lorraine were secretly preparing a lightning strike towards Buda, where they would take the Turks by surprise and deliver the heart of Hungary from the yoke of Islam. All that stood in their way was the onset of winter, but for once the weather was on their side. The King of Poland set the pace, with Lorraine following behind. The King of Poland, impatient of delay, contrary to expectation, immediately mounted on horseback and sent to advise the Duke of Lorraine that he was marching towards Barkan. Leaving his infantry to follow, Lorraine hurried with his cuirassiers and dragoons to catch up with the Poles. As Sobieski blundered forward, without sending scouts ahead, the Turks prepared an ambush. Their Tartars watched every move of the advancing Poles, counted their numbers, and observed their ragged formation. The commander in Estergom dispatched thousands of reinforcements sent from Buda across the Estergom Bridge. By the time the Poles neared the Barkan Palanka, more than 7,000 Ottomans were concealed on the reverse side of the hillside. All that Sobieski saw were a few Turkish and Tartar horse in front of the wooden fortress, and he ordered a full attack to overwhelm this thin line of defense. As soon as the Polish hussars were committed irrevocably to the charge, led by the king himself, the Ottoman commander sprung his trap. It was a classic Turkish maneuver. Fast-moving sipahis swarmed on all sides, racing forward to cut off the Poles' retreat. Lorraine's liaison officer, riding with the king, saw the looming catastrophe and hurriedly sent a galloper back to the duke, telling him that the Poles were being overwhelmed, and more and more Ottomans were pouring into the attack. Lorraine immediately took his leading dragoons and cuirassiers forward through the scrubland at a fast trot until he reached the edge of the plain before Barkan. He dismounted the dragoons and drew them up in formation like musketeers, battaglia, but protected by the cuirassier squadrons. As the Poles fled from the battlefield, with the bulky figure of Sobieski the target for every Turk, they passed through Lorraine's lines, and many of the Turks racing forward in pursuit were brought down by the dragoons' firepower. At dusk, the battered and bedraggled Ottoman Sipahis withdrew below the walls of Barkan, while Lorraine and Sobieski pulled back to wait for their infantry and field guns to arrive. After dark, the Ottoman commander in Estergom sent thousands more men across the narrow bridge to reinforce his troops on the northern bank. But as dawn came, the Turks saw before them 16,000 Poles and Imperial troops drawn up in battle formation. Almost the whole army had arrived from the west. At about nine o'clock, Turks and Christians began to move slowly forward towards each other, when the Ottoman cavalry made a sudden mass assault on the Polish wing. In a moment, the whole body of the Ottomans began to converge on Sobieski's banners. As the Turks locked in hand-to-hand -hand combat with the Hussars and the Polish footmen behind, Lorraine charged at the head of his cuirassiers and dragoons, smashing into the Sipahi's flank. In one instant, the confident Ottoman horsemen were slaughtering the Poles, and the next they were being attacked on both sides, crushed by the heavier and larger western horse, and without any space to maneuver. Trapped, without the heavy armor of their adversaries, they managed finally to cut a passage back towards the fort. As they fled, smashing volleys of musket fire from the Habsburg infantry under Starenberg's command broke up their ranks, while Prince Ludwig Wilhelm of Baden was blooded for the first time in battle against the Turk. Soon to be nicknamed Turken Louis, a scarlet poppy was later named after him, recalling the fountains of enemy blood he had spilt. It perhaps referred as well to the vast quantity of Ottoman booty, Turkin Boite, that he had carried back to decorate his great, unfinished palace, Schloss Rastat. A kinsman of Eugene, he had the same spirit of daring and adaptability as his younger cousin, and in a few minutes he turned the confident Ottoman assault into a rout, as they raced back to the Palanka, then across the bridge to the fortress of Estergom.
What happened in the two days of battle before Barkin was to be repeated many times in the years that followed. The speed of an Ottoman attack was a constant terror for the Westerners. In a few seconds, the Turks and Tartars would appear as if from nowhere, slashing with their swords and cutting down men and horses alike. If the Western line broke, either under pressure from the swarms of Sipahi horsemen or crushed by the irresistible rush of the Janissaries, ululating and bellowing their battle cries, then the Turks would gain the day. But if the solid Western lines could hold, their discipline intact, if they could push forward field fortifications like the spiked Cheveux de Frise and keep up a steady rate of fire, it would be the Turks who would break and flee from the field in chaos and panic. At Barkan, they fled back into the Palanca, so many of them that they completely filled the small enclosure, leaving hundreds exposed outside, clamoring to enter. Ludwig Wilhelm of Baden brought up three cannon and also lined up his dragoons to fire at close range into the seething Ottoman mass. The wooden walls of the Palanca caught fire, and the slaughter that was there made by fire and sword was very cruel and bloody. Of the thousands who crowded into the small courtyard, only some seven or eight hundred survived, relatively safe in the fort, until they could surrender. Worse still was the fate of those who tried to cross the Danube by the wooden bridge. When this broke apart under the weight of the men pressing to cross, thousands were thrown into the water. Some endeavored to save themselves by swimming, others by their horses hanging on their manes and tails, others on planks and boards of the broken bridge. The greatest part perished in the waters, as appeared by the bodies of men and horses, together with their garments, which covered the surface of the river. As he watched the Ottomans perish in the river, a driving compulsion gripped Charles of Lorraine. He would lead the army securely across the Danube, besiege and take the strategic city of Estragon, and thus crown the year with a final triumph. The fortress had been fought over six times since the Ottoman conquest in 1543, with possession shifting back and forth between Turk and Habsburg. The Ottomans had held it securely for almost 80 years, and gradually obliterated the last vestiges of its Hungarian identity. If Lorraine could not take Buda, as he had hoped, Estragon was a good alternative. The guns of its citadel controlled all traffic up and down the Danube, and until it was taken, it would be impossible to ship the siege artillery necessary for taking Buda down the river. The last of Lorraine's troops had finally caught up with the hard-riding cavalry, and the Bavarian infantry was rested and keen to engage the enemy. The Poles were not. Morale was at a low ebb in the Polish camp after the initial humiliation at Barkan, and beginning a long siege was not the way to restore it. The Hussar and their retinues wanted revenge against the Ottoman cavalry, not frustrating in action in the trenches before a well-defended city. King John Sobieski was reluctant to expose his men to what might be a long siege. There were insistent murmurings that he was seeking to drag them into a protracted war in Hungary, which seemed unnecessary and even against Poland's interests. While Lorraine and his staff found a point downstream out of range of the Ottoman artillery where the river could be bridged, the Poles sulked in their tents. On 20 October, the new bridge was completed, and the Habsburg and Allied infantry began to file across, followed one by one by the siege guns. Within a day, in driving rain, they created batteries which could reach every part of the city. On the 24th, the rain slackened and the guns began to bombard the walled town and the citadel. Before the assault began, the Grand Vizier had sent reinforcements and supplies to Estragon, believing that the attackers would be destroyed by a long siege, the same fate he had suffered before Vienna. If that happened, the defeat at Barkan could be justified to the Sultan, and Kara Mustafa could then rout his enemies at court while presenting a plausible strategy to redeem Ottoman losses in the following year. Unfortunately for his plan, six days after the guns began to fire on Estragon, the Turkish garrison surrendered on exceptionally favorable terms. The Grand Vizier had left Buda before the attack started, and arriving in Belgrade to find that the Sultan had already returned to his palace at Adirne, he began to wreak vengeance on his enemies. But he could not prevent news of these fresh disasters reaching the ears of Mecca. Ahmed IV on 14 December, and from that moment he was doomed. Estragon, first captured by Suleiman I, then defended with great valor by its garrison in 1595, had fallen in less than a week. 
the Sultan felt dishonored, and traditionally those responsible for such a loss paid with their lives. Two senior court officials were sent north to Belgrade, and on 25 December they came to the Grand Vizier at the time of the midday prayer. They showed him the warrant from the Sultan demanding return of the seal, the holy standard of the Prophet, and the key to the Kaaba in Mecca, emblems of his office. Then they told him that he was to suffer death. Kara Mustafa met his death with stoic Ottoman calm, as befitted a prelude. First he removed his rich fur-trimmed robe, then his turban, and handed them to a servant. Next he asked that a carpet on which he had been kneeling be removed so that his body would fall to the earth, symbolizing that he died as a warrior and so his entry into paradise would be assured. Two executioners with a silken cord stepped forward and stood silently behind him. The Grand Vizier knelt again, this time in the dust of the floor, raising his long beard with his hands so that his neck was exposed. Then, with practiced ease, his executioners flipped the soft cord over his head and tightened it around his neck, pulling steadily with all their strength. He died quickly, with barely a visible tremor, a corpse held up by the strangler's noose. They lowered his body into the dirt, and one swiftly severed the head from the corpse, exactly in accordance with the sultan's orders. Then, between them, they stripped the skull of its skin and stuffed it with dry straw, making a grisly but recognizable trophy. The head and the trunk, wrapped together in a white grave cloth, were taken to a nearby mosque and buried just outside the enclosure. Mission accomplished. The little party, with the stuffed head wrapped in a silk cloth and placed in a saddlebag, set out for Edirne. So ended the long and controversial career of Kara Mustafa of Merzifon. 10. Storming Buddha While Europeans regarded Sultan Mehmed IV with a mixture of disdain and distaste, Kara Mustafa was the enemy incarnate. The attack on Vienna was seen with reason as his personal malign intention, conceived from his deep hatred of the West in all its works. I have argued that there were good political motives for the Ottoman assault in 1683, and it failed largely because of the Grand Vizier's military ineptitude. He was experienced, but in the wrong kind of war. Kara Mustafa's failure, ignominious retreat, and condign punishment were greeted with glee in Western Europe. There were images of the wounded vizier hunched over a half-starved horse in flight from Vienna. The popular French novelist Jean de Préchac found an international market with his life of the Grand Vizier. The frontispiece depicted his end, and, as his English translator observed, showed how the Vizier, who had killed so many, was paid with his own coin. The lesson for English readers was very simple. Englishmen cannot be very sensible of their happiness when they see the most tyrannical government of the Turkish Empire. They cannot, I say, but praise God when they consider how unhappy is the condition of subjects that live under a monarch who makes the law the only rule of his government, in comparison to that of those that groan under the heavy yoke of a prince who follows no other rule but his own will. The rise and fall of Kara Mustafa became a moral fable, epitomizing the inexorable decline of the Ottomans. Sir Peter Rico, in his Great History of the Turkish Empire, published in 1700, declared ex cathedra with his unquestionable authority that the defeat before Vienna was so fatal to them that they never recovered their courage and spirits again. At this point, fact and fiction became entirely and irretrievably intermingled. Rico was simply wrong. The Ottomans did recover their spirits. The Allies were happy to believe otherwise, for they were organizing the reconquest of Hungary. The shock of success at Vienna, the hopeful wish fulfillment typified by Rico, stimulated vast ambitions to throw Islam back into Asia. In France, the elderly Father Copin, putting the finishing touches to his manuscript, observed, What I am seeking today will be in incomparably more than a crusade. He proposed a unified attack on the Ottomans, by sea in the Mediterranean and the Adriatic, by land in Hungary, with the Christian states acting together to destroy their hereditary enemy. 
For once, this aspiration was being transformed into something like reality. Early in February 1684, Sultan Mehmed IV at Adirne received an alarming report from Belgrade. The commander in Hungary had heard that the Christian states were joining together against the Turks, determined to win the battle for Europe. The Ottoman Empire would be assailed on every side. In the spring, the Russians would attack the Tartars in the Crimea, while the Poles would advance along the river Dniester and then push south into Ottoman-dominated Wallachia. Venice would attack Bosnia, seek to regain Crete and ravage the Aegean. All were engaged in this great encircling action. Sweden, France, Spain, England, the United Provinces of the Netherlands, Genoa, and the Papacy. Although this vast combined attack was exaggerated, in essence the threat was real. On 5 March 1684, the King of Poland, the Emperor Leopold, and the Doge of Venice signed an agreement to wage war on the Ottomans and not to make peace unless all three parties agreed. Even after any further peace was signed, they were still to remain committed to a permanent mutual defensive alliance against any future Ottoman attack. Behind the agreement stood Pope Innocent XI. All the Christian nations were invited to join in this assault on the common enemy. And not merely Christian nations. The Emperor Leopold even commissioned a Catholic Archbishop, Sebastian Nab, already in Persia, to see if the Shah could be drawn into an alliance against the common Turkish enemy. But the course of events was not as Rico described it. The Ottomans displayed an extraordinary resilience and fortitude which the West put down to their innate bellicosity, but what it revealed was their capacity to raise and support armies in the field year after year. The capital Istanbul might seethe with discontent, the court might be riven with faction, but the Sultan's decree could still set the entire military and logistical system in motion once again. Through the winter of 1683-4, to four, the Habsburg administration worked feverishly to reassemble an army for the conquest of the East. It was much easier than the task which had confronted them a year before. This new war in the East would still be a war of good against evil, but it also promised booty and glory, if the perquisites of victory from the Ottoman camp at Vienna were any precedent. There was intense competition for the Supreme Command the office formerly occupied by King John Sobieski. The challengers included the young elector Max Emanuel of Bavaria, who demanded his own independent command. After his marriage in July 1685, he would be a member of the Habsburg dynasty. But Charles of Lorraine was already part of the imperial circle and insisted that he should be supreme commander, and if not, he might take no further part in the campaign. A new and fresh contender was Ludwig Wilhelm, the ruling margrave of Baden-Baden, who had the influential support of his uncle Hermann, Marquis of Baden, president of the Habsburg War Council. Another powerful participant in the offensive would be the Calvinist ruler of Brandenburg, Friedrich Wilhelm. The great elector had been one of the more successful generals in the Thirty Years' War. But in 1683, he had resisted all appeals to help the Emperor Leopold. Now he volunteered his superbly trained troops for the new war. Too old to take command in person, he demanded a sweetener in the form of Habsburg territory in Silesia as recompense for his trouble. But it was April 1686 before the agreement could be signed, and only then did 8,000 well-trained Prussian infantry and cavalry join the war in Hungary. In the Habsburg court, there was strong pressure, led by Lorraine and the Emperor's spiritual advisor, Marco Daviano, for immediate action. Under pressure, the Emperor gave the order to attack the weakened Ottoman army in 1684, before this lengthy process of assembling the Allied army could be completed. The troops gathered at the town of Scalia on the river Vag, with about 43,000 men dedicated to the conquest of Buda. On 20 May, they began marching in separate columns along the northern bank of the Danube, past Barkan, and along the southern bank, heading for the hilltop Ottoman fortress of Visegrad, which lay a few miles away at the narrowest part of the sharp bend of the Danube. This was the last strong point on the southern bank before Buda, some 30 miles away. On 15 June, Lorraine emplaced his guns before Visegrad and began the bombardment. 
Two days later, with the garrison still resisting, he sent them an ultimatum. If they opened the gates and yielded the citadel, they would be set free. If they continued to resist, the whole garrison should be impaled. On the following day, the garrison of Visegrad marched away bag and baggage, and so avoided the awful and humiliating death that had been threatened. Now the path was completely clear as far as Buda. The Allies' mood was confident because they had heard that the garrison of Pest and Buda consisted of only 8,000 men, and that near Buda there were only two or 3,000 Tartars. Count Florimond von Mercy, a young Lorrainer who had only entered Habsburg service in 1682, led the scouts in the 1684 campaign. He brought direct confirmation. The entire Turkish force in Hungary between the Danube in the north and the Drava River in the south was no more than 17,000 men, and there was no sign of any more marching north. But as the army marched on towards Buda, Ottoman resistance increased. As the infantry pressed forward, protected by cuirassiers in their black helmets and armor, they were suddenly opposed by a huge body of Turkish cavalry in the traditional crescent moon formation. General Halivail, leading the cavalry squadrons, was nearly overwhelmed, and as they retreated, he fell from his horse, pierced by a dart in the breast and an arrow in the face. More heavy cavalry galloped into the melee to support the hard-pressed cuirassiers and drove off the Sipahis, who retired carrying Austrian prisoners away with them. The idea that the Turks had no will or capacity to resist quickly vanished as more of these swift and unexpected attacks dogged the advance through hilly country. When they came upon the Ottoman field army at Weizenvatz, close to Pest, it was more than 18,000 strong with cannon and infantry. The Ottomans immediately attacked and fell upon our left wing with very great noise and fury. Each time they were beaten back, but charged again and again. Only when the Allies' field artillery was brought forward and fired repeated salvos into the mass of Turkish troops were they driven off. More than a thousand Turks, men and officers, were killed and about the same number taken prisoner. The body of one pasha attracted much attention because of his prodigious corpulence. Many wondered how he could ride a horse at all, let alone into battle. This would not be a straightforward campaign. Much of the cavalry's time was spent in searching for fodder for the horses, as the Habsburg supply system was less effective than the Ottoman. Moreover, Tartars could live simply off the country and could survive on whatever was available. These foraging parties were easy prey for Turkish raiders. In each encounter, once they could bring their firepower and superior discipline into play, the Allies would drive their enemy from the field. But there could never be any sense of security. The Tartars and Sipahis would be back the following day, or even the same evening, hacking at the fringes of the advancing army. The Turkish infantry could also move at great speed, and the contemporary accounts tell time and again of detachments caught unawares, cut down by a mass of Turks who quickly retreated, fled the field when reinforcements came up. The Turks, having rallied, were immediately at their heels, and putting themselves into some order, fell barbarously on our right wing. In the summer of 1684, Lorraine took a very sanguine view of his chances of taking Buda. He was still waiting for the arrival of the Bavarians, who would greatly strengthen his infantry and artillery, but even without them, he decided to begin the siege. He now had an open supply line along the Danube to Vienna, and his engineers quickly reinstated the floating bridges across the Danube between Pest and Buda, which 